Hello. Uh, I'm going to talk about advances in order independent transparency for real time and virtual production workflows. My name is Pritish Kakar. I work as a senior graphics engineer at Adobe. Um, the agenda is going to be what exactly is order independent transparency and why it's important, some of the real use cases and some world uh, examples, and then we are going to talk about various OIT techniques and some uh, recent um, machine learning based as well as another technique that is a little bit more advanced. Uh, so what is the fundamental problem here? Uh, one of the things when you are blending multiple objects that are transparent, uh, it matters what the object ordering is. So if, the, uh, so if you see it on a diagram on the right, you will see that the green on the top of the red versus red on the top of the green produces different color because the, uh, because the blending is not commutative. Uh, so the depth sorting order matters and you are not going to get the right result unless you get the sorting correct. Um, now you could argue that we could sort this all on the CPU by different, uh, we can take geometry based on the depth, we can sort it on CPU, that's a possibility, but there are cases where um, various geometries could self-intersect or with the other, other geometries and that would, uh, it would be almost impossible in some cases and in some cases it would just be not performant and it would just not work. And if we are somehow able to, you know, uh, create multiple triangles out of the existing triangles, we we would get wrong sorting order or we would we would have too many performance penalties. So what is order independent transparency? So the idea with the order independent transparency is that you want to solve a multiple semi-transparent object, but you don't want to do the sorting on the CPU. At least you don't want to do any kind of sorting as you are moving the camera on the CPU. So you want this sorting to be done, if there is any sorting, to be done on the fragment shader and use GPU as uh, efficiently as possible. Uh, so here is an example on the right that you see. You will see something is off with this transparent car, and of course that's because this is how it should look. Without an OIT, this is what you're going to get if you don't have the correct blending order and you get just blend stuff, uh, you know, randomly as they're coming in, but this should be the right order. Um, here are some of the real world examples where OIT techniques are very important. If you are doing um, in gaming or VFX, if you're doing any kind of foliage, any kind of smoke effects or particle systems, all of these are require some kind of order independent transparency techniques, uh, specifically if you're building real, um, real time systems. Um, in CAD software also you will need some of these techniques as well as in medical software specifically for example VTK uh, which is a medical uh, library that's used uh, extensively in medical programs like Slicer. You will need these kind of techniques where transparency becomes important uh, to focus on a particular element on the, uh, in, uh, there is an example here. Uh, there are other things where transparency is important. Let's say you are doing ocean rendering or some kind of another technique like hair rendering or those kind of techniques and you want to do it in real time, transparency and getting the right transparency effects are important. Uh, let's talk about high level on some of the traditional OIT techniques that has been used uh, previously or has, uh, it, it's currently also used by some engines. Uh, so one of them is called depth peeling. So uh, the idea with the depth peeling is that instead of, you, you are continuously peeling multiple depths of the objects and then you are producing multiple textures that you could be blended together. So in this diagram you can imagine that there is a camera looking at this circle and then some triangulated geometry and from, from that camera angle you will peel this first blue layer or whatever is visible on that one. In the second step you will peel the surfaces that is next after that. In the third step you will peel the rest of the surface and in this case you only have three level of depth that could be peeled and then all of that could be merged together. Um, from front to back or back to front depending upon how you have done the peeling and you will get the correct result. Now you can imagine if you have too many surfaces uh, you will have to continuously peel and you will need a lot of you know memory consumption here and we will talk about that a little bit. Uh, then there is another approach called per pixel link list. Uh, so the idea here is you are maintaining a linked list on GPU in the fragment shader where you are storing the value of every fragment that coming for a certain pixel and you are having this link list that's storing the color data and the depth data and then you can pretty much merge this link list in a composite pass 
where you can figure out, uh, based on the depth, you can sort this linked list in your final composite, full screen, let's say, pass, and you can then merge it. Um, this will produce the correct result. However, you can't use infinite memory because um, you will run out of the memory at certain point of time. So most of the applications or most of the use cases pretty much uh, provides a particular K elements to every pixel and uh, K is limited to a certain range. That means any fragments that's coming after after a certain set of fragments would either be not simply used or there is another technique called tail blending, which the idea is that the, anything after K would simply be blended with the last fragment. And this would give you some results, but as you can imagine, the results could be wrong in that case. Uh, then there is a, another important technique called multi-layered alpha blending or MLAB, uh, commonly referred to MLAB. Um, the idea here is that uh, previously what we have done in uh, alpha blending or um, OIT is we are not paying attention to how the light is losing energy as it's traveling through various transparent medium. So if you would be doing something like this in ray tracing or a path tracing, which is the offline workflow, you will naturally have a ray that would lose energy as it hits one surface, other surface, and so and so forth on. But most of the traditional technique does not consider this um, um, approach uh, when they are when we are trying to implement um, OIT uh, with multi-layered alpha blending. The idea is we are going to basically use the um, a transmission function that would be calculated based upon how much light is being trans uh, transmitted from one triangle or one surface to another surface and so forth and so on. So if the first fragment is getting a certain li uh, certain value of uh, light, we will use the opacity value to decide how much the light would translate, uh, trans uh, would get to the next surface and from the next one to the, uh, the next one it's going to hit. So we have, the, we have this transmission function and then we can actually limit the memory size the benefit of this is that when we are going to run out of the number of the elements that can go into the list that we have, we still have a list here, but now we can have a very shorter list per pixel. The new fragments can be merged with the other fragments, but we can actually figure out the error, what error they will produce if it's merged with A versus B versus C and all those kind of combinations. That way you know which is the best, uh, which, which merging will result in the closest uh, value. And that will give you more accurate result because now you are physically uh, doing the correct thing, uh, or, or I would say less, um, less non-accurate results. And, uh, and in the final pass, you still have to do compositing. Um, this is uh, just a two-pass approach where you have one pass to do this transmission and then the other pass to do the blending. Uh, then uh, we have another uh, uh, um, um, interesting technique called weighted OIT or layered weighted OIT. Um, and layered weighted OIT builds on the top of weighted OIT. So let me explain what weighted OIT is. So the idea is, let's say you have a bunch of transparent elements in your scene, but when you are blending it, a lot of uh, the the most of the front facing transparent geometry is what is contributing to the final pixel, right? And that's where the, the weighted OIT is a way where you can use the alpha and the depth value to generate a, a function that will give more importance to the, uh, to the fragments that are in the front versus the fragments that are in the far away. So, but the problem with this approach is it depends on the, the function needs to be tweaked based on the scene. And that could, that, that's really a difficult problem if you don't know what your scene would be or if it's a user-defined scene and can change. And tweaking that function is not straightforward. Um, the layered weighted OIT improved that weighted OIT slightly by basically, instead of using just one weighted function across your first term, it would basically create multiple bins. Now you can imagine these bins could be where more, uh, where there is a X number of transparent uh, uh, geometry or X amount of depth, and based on that, you can have a different depth functions for each of the bins, and that would give you better result for each of the bins because now you have constrained your problem to a smaller set of depth area. Now you will have to still merge those multiple bins together, and that's where you don't want to do like 
just an average or you know raw merging because that would yield a wrong result. So there is another function you will need to merge the bins together, and uh, some uh, something like a bell-shaped function would be better, and it would not cause any visual artifacts. Uh, most of these techniques comes from various research papers. So uh, you know there would be uh, there are research papers available on these techniques that could be read to understand uh, in detail. Uh, another very important and interesting technique uh, that I actually recently uh, learned and implemented was uh, is called stochastic layered alpha blending. So. As we understood in some of the previous t uh, techniques, almost every technique has a certain amount of memory budget. And that's the memory budget we can't go over. And that's a fundamental problem. What stochastic alpha layered blending does, it, it's, it's using still a certain amount of memory budget, but it's instead of using just one frame and making sure every frame gets the correct results or a certain result, it's doing this over n frames. So for each frame, we are stochastically or randomly picking a certain amount of fragments that are coming in based upon a concept called coverage mask. The coverage mask is generated based upon the fragment depth, alpha, and a random seed that is created as well as the frame ID. And based upon that a coverage mask, we are deciding whether an incoming fragment should go into the list or not. Of course, we are going to be generating a coverage. Uh, think about think of a coverage mask as a set of bits, and you can decide how many bits you want to allocate for it. And then each time you are getting a new fragment, you can based upon whether the new fragment will make it into that. Um, into the list would depend upon whether there is enough spaces left into this coverage mask bit area that we have defined and the new randomly generated uh, uh, coverage mask that we have generated for the fragment that's coming in. What happens doing this, it will converge after n frame, it would start converging uh, to the right uh, result and it's gonna get you the uh, right results but uh, when you are moving the camera, you will see some noise because you are not um, using all the all the all the possible um, uh, fragments that are coming in, so you are only using a certain uh, set of fragments for one frame, and then different fragments for second frame, and over ten frames or x frames, they will converge and give you a right result. But as you are moving camera, you will see some fragments were just zip because they did not meet the random check. Um, it's an interesting technique if you already have, let's say. Um, something like a shadow that was done using ray tracing, which was anyway stochastic. So if you have anything in your algorithm that accumulation-based, stochastic-based, implementing this on the top of that is uh, easier. Uh, one of the other interesting techniques is called moment-based OIT. Uh, so one of the things with the, our previous OIT techniques were we were always using this blending operator, which is, an, which is commonly referred as over operator. And it's not, uh, you, you can't just do it in any direction. It needs to be done in a certain order. Uh, what movement-based OIT does it, it's basically generating, it's doing two things. It's actually taking what we had in um, multi-layered alpha blending, which is basically generating a transmission function, which is important because otherwise we are not going to get um, the results correct because we are not mimicking as, as the light, um, light uh, moves through different medium. And, but it also makes it, it also uses something called Haar wavelets to express the, uh, express the transmission using these uh, coefficients that then can be sampled when you are doing the final shading. The benefit of these coefficients are that um, not only they can represent like uh, uh, different uh, uh, complex uh, transmission that is happening uh, when the surfaces are getting changed, and uh, it can also it's also additive. It's not blending. Uh, it's it's additive. That means you can blend them. Uh, then that means you can add them in any order. So you have actually moved away from blending, which was a certain order. You can only do it you can now do just at any order. So all you need to do is basically uh, do some kind of a wavelet, uh, wavelet generation pass, and then when you are finally shading it, you get this data that can be composed at any order. You don't have to worry about the ordering problem there. Uh, you, have solved, you have kind of solved that ordering problem previously by generating this wavelet. Um, uh, wavelet is, uh, think about if you, uh, the, these hard wavelets are just a way of representation, similar to what Fourier does, but the Fourier is more for smooth uh, surfaces where there are not like uh, 
dips um, in case of our in case of this uh, transparency uh, kind of problem we have basically pretty much a flash thing and then a dip basically so uh, there is a lot of transitions happening that's why a hard weblet function is a better way to represent them um, one of the recent techniques that I played a little bit with but haven't uh, implemented or haven't gotten great results yet is called Deep Learning Based OIT. This is a recent paper that was published around in 22 or 23, uh, 2022 or 2023. Um, the idea is you are going to basically take multiple scenes that you are doing, that you are going to use to infer how to produce the k-buffer. So think about this technique as way to figure out how many elements, how many fragments a particular pixel should use. But instead of having a fixed number of, pix, a fixed number of let's say, um, nodes for each pixel, you are going to drive those number of nodes at runtime by querying this neural network. And this neural network can be trained, of course, on multiple scenes with multiple camera views. Uh, but uh, and uh, then it will be able to give you the particular imp uh, importance of that pixel, and that can be used to figure out how many nodes you should be given to that particular um, uh, uh, fixer, pixel when uh, to, uh, for consuming the fragments. So here is an example where you have, let's say, eight scenes, you have eight camera views, and you are using 12 features to create this very, and this is a very thin neural network. So you can, it's not like a transformer model or something very heavy. It's a very thin neural network, very fast to infer from, and with the more of the tensor curves and uh, Vulkan extensions like Vulkan cooperative metrics, uh, you can use this directly on the device uh, to infer the importance of the uh, pixels. Uh, uh, per uh, or, uh, number of fragments per pixel. And here you have this uh, distribution heat map that can be produced where, which is trying to tell you this is the particular pixel where we need more fragments versus uh, less. Uh, versus less. So this means we can still keep our fixed memory budget, but can use K more efficiently because we are not bound by using the same number of element for every pixel. A um, few key takeaways from this would be um, what techniques to use when. Um, it will depend upon your application, uh, but with depth feeling, you are using less memory. You just have a couple of textures that you're going to be blending together. But the performance is super slow, because you can imagine you are rendering the same thing again and again to get the depths. Uh, with K-buffer, um, you can get a decent performance and uh, decent memory. I've, I've, I've seen it being used at multiple uh, you know, applications, but the accuracy is limited, uh, and specifically since it does not mimic uh, transmission function at all, and also it depends on the value of the K. If the K is very small, you would see for a complex scene, you will just not get the correct results. Um, weighted OIT or layered weighted OIT is very much scene dependent. Of course, the memory is very low. The performance is high because it's just you know one pass to generate stuff and then one pass to compose it. And uh, but but of course, uh, it it could be a very useful technique if you are able to tune your um, function per scene and you know um, uh, you have a, a certain limited uh, scene details. Uh, Moment-based OIT is, again, an important and interesting technique. I would say the performance is uh, not as great as, let's say, multi-layered alpha blending because it's using more passes uh, compared to multi-layered alpha blending. Um, my pick for most of the applications would be something like multi-layered alpha blending because it takes into consideration the transmission function as well as its performance is decent, it's two-pass approach. Um, stochastic layered alpha blending is another one which has a fixed memory and uh, very efficient, but the only problem is if, you are, if, you are, if your application already doesn't do accumulation, doesn't do any stochastic passes, it's, uh, it's quite a work to implement it as well as you will see the noise. Uh, deep learning is something to experiment with. I haven't gotten the results always great, and sometimes it hasn't worked that well for me, uh, but uh, I've only played it in mostly in the hobby court right now, so this is something, some area to explore more. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, any questions I'm happy to take. Um, I would be in the area. Thank you.